All right, everyone, good evening. Why don't you gather here? And hi to all of our viewers online. I hope there's tons of you there. <laughs> My name is Trin. I am today representing here North Star AI. Uh, how many of you have visited any of our meetups or the yearly conference? Yeah, most of you. Is there anyone who doesn't know anything about Nostar AI? Okay, for you, we are a community of AI practitioners. We grew out of a meetup uh, that AI leaders from Estonia were doing, and we understood that there is a big uh, talent shortage in the region. And that's why we have been doing these events and gatherings uh, over four years now. Uh, we are about to change our vision and um, uh, expand to Europe as well, meaning that uh, previously we, our aim was to connect uh, AI practitioners from Europe with the world. Now we see that uh, um, maybe the Silicon Valley context is not uh, relating to the practitioners here, so we want to unite the data scientists and AI engineers here in Europe. Today, uh, we have another meetup. It's the kickoff of the season. Previously, we have doing and focusing mostly on the technical meetups. This time, we are also talking about uh, uh, business challenges uh, when applying AI. And I'm super grateful that we are here today at this super awesome uh, venue that is powered by Super Angels. And we partnered up with them and, uh, uh, because uh, they have an AI track coming up. And we are extremely glad to see that we, at, home, uh, at home base in uh, Estonia we have a VC that is dedicated to AI startups mostly. And I'd like to welcome here Velio uh, from a partner at Super Angels who will tell you more what kind of uh, startups they are looking for and how they can help you. Uh, Velio. You. You, you. Thank you. You're welcome. So, one, two. Okay. Uh, so yeah, really glad to host this event first time here. Happy to do it also uh, next time uh, if needed. Um, so I'm uh, here to tell you a very brief promotional <laughs> message about what we are doing. So uh, Super Angel is a, a early stage investor, and we have an Alpine House program where we help early stage companies like sort of build and uh, and get to the next level uh, we have uh, so a huge network of uh, experts and 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 partners and investors in super angel uh, who are all happy to share their knowledge as well um, uh, so we have been backed by by bolt founders uh, willix and uh, oliver leisalo and uh, uh, Hendrik was from uh, Transferwise and Norris Copper from Moniz and uh, and many more. Um, so and what so so what what we're doing over the over the 12 months in the program is uh, uh, is is giving you really like tailor-made uh, uh, advice, uh, lots of uh, workshop sessions with uh, people who have already built great things in in AI space and in general. Uh, and also, we take our startups twice a year to a big market for for a search for new customers and uh, new investors. So this fall, we're going to to Silicon Valley, and uh, and in the spring, maybe somewhere else. Uh, so yeah, and the applications uh, are open just a few more days. Uh, we're closing on August 21st, uh, 31st, and also we're open to individual applicants who want to join a startup for a weekend or maybe for a longer time uh, so we're like so next step in the end of September we're in inviting 10 to 15 uh, startups into our base camp hackathon which is going to be held here as well um, and um, and then like individual applicants can also join the teams if they want and uh, and then out of those and we usually end up cooperating with up to five teams in our Alpenhouse program. So yeah, so happy to have more AI uh, intensive startups in the program. Um, yeah, so I guess 
that's it uh, from me and uh, continue in the, in the most interesting part. Okay, thank you, William. Uh, you can find information on their website, Alpine House and Super Angel. We're continuing with our program. We have four uh, presenters today. Half of them are business-minded, others are uh, more technical-focused. As we have uh, little house rules, as we have audience uh, uh, looking at uh, from homes as well, if you want to ask a question, and that's very welcome, so please ask questions or challenge the presenters, just raise your hand and I'm going to give you your microphone Otherwise, the ones at home won't uh, hear you that much. Uh, first, pan uh, first presenter today is Tavi Tamkivi, representing his startup Titan, uh, Tatum Miner. Uh, Tavi has uh, an awesome background. He has seen uh, uh, and experienced uh, how Skype grew up, how TransferWise grew up, and now he's representing his own early stage startup. Uh, startup. And I'm extremely glad that you're here, Tavi, because you can uh, uh, give us an overview of what are uh, the specifics of an early stage startup. And why don't you come here and take the stage? So if anyone has questions, just wave to me. Go thank ahead. You, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here and uh, especially for the Palo Alto climate uh, that you also somehow have, uh, have um, brought here. I just uh, remember so well the machine learning club uh, or like a movement here in Estonia when Andre, Andre organized the first event, it was like four years ago when 400 people or 300 people all together in the same room. So like, it's glad to see that uh, actually now the, the most interesting, um, interested people are actually gathering here, not, not a great mess. Um, but yeah, like it's, I was trying to understand, like, uh, am I the business, should I talk about the business or the technology? But it's like I'm kind of in the Both. middle, I'm kind of in the middle of those. Um, yeah, like I, I was told I was building a fraud, anti-fraud um, team and, and capabilities back at Skype for many, many years and did also customer analytics over there. So I learned to work uh, with the huge data sets, like it wasn't called big data back then, but, but nowadays I think even, even in our, our days it's like called quite significant amount of data, so basically covering the global uh, uh, credit card fraud attacks, account takeovers, uh, just uh, spamming um, other type of the hack uh, um, with, the, with the Skype team back in Mustama, which was quite close uh, uh, in the middle of Tallinn. And transfer-wise, I joined a few years later, so I started to build up the whole compliance uh, over there early days when Christo German was the only one who was, like, knew how, to, how they, they were fighting um, money laundering. So I, I took it over from, from him and built up the like, uh, customer onboarding, KYC, document verification, um, like also fraud, um, different procedures and teams and, uh, and uh, the products as well. Uh, I was leading, leading different products and, and finally I focused on the AML anti-money laundering product itself. So in these days, the anti-money laundering uh, seems to be quite a hot, hot topic if you look at uh, the media here in like, Estonia or the rest of the Europe um, and US as well. But back then it was like uh, something which was flying under the radar for the, for the public uh, publicity at least. Um, and yeah, like, uh, then I, I founded uh, my own little company, Data Miner, which is focusing on now on the crime fighting, uh, crime detection, uh, and especially focusing on anti money laundering activities, uh, which large banks, uh, fintechs, uh, casi online casinos, and everyone actually needs to apply in their, in their work. But I'll focus on that a bit later on. And yeah, I've like, been studying uh, mathematics for 27 years uh, in different schools. Uh, Finally, I, I, like, I stopped out, I stepped out from the PhD studies at Tartu University after trying eight years or so. Uh, but yeah, like I was studying pure probability, probability theory. So I just wanted to check like, how technical people we have here. Like, does, like, please raise your hands like, who knows what the hidden Markov models are and like, what you can do with them. I guess like, yeah, good 10%. So it's not, uh, <coughs> not uh, because like I wanted to present or <coughs> brand my my company is a non-AI or like anti-AI or whatever, because like I really, really am focusing on real problem solution and sometimes we're using like, um, like more sophisticated models, sometimes we we're using a bit simpler models, but, but we never call it AI or machine learning even, we've been trying to ignore these terms. So I don't uh, dive too, too much into, into mathematics uh, at this point. So basically what's the... What's the problem we are solving and what's the mission that, that our team has? Like we currently we have 
about 20 people all together in data miner. At least half of them um, can be classified as a data miners, like uh, data science people. At least they can know how to play around with, with, with big data and, and build models around that. Mm. And then the rest of the guys are experts in the, in the crime fighting, either from the like, from regulatory side of things or from the classical fraud detection. So, and, and what we figured out, like most of us are coming from Skype or TransferWise, and what we figured out uh, when we left our companies that actually this problem that we were resolving back there, like, um, like being, uh, helping um, one single fintech to be compliant uh, with all the global regulations, uh, and also to detect crime and also to keep the customers happy at the same time, we realized that the whole world is actually struggling uh, with that. And, um, and, and when zooming in, like how much crime there is happening, like, like anti money laundering itself, it sounds like a white color, white color thing and some bankers are like, some um, bad bankers maybe are, are like uh, earning their new Ferraris and stuff, but actually behind that there are people who are getting killed, um, like physically killed. Uh, there are like, there is, um, human trafficking, um, including child and children and women. There is uh, like, um, like wild animals are getting killed, uh, um, and so on and so on, like between uh, like uh, money, uh, like uh, political money being moved from like uh, Moscow to London, drugs being moved from Mexico to US, uh, people are being trafficked between like Europe and Africa and so on. So it's, it's actually the main intention of these activities is actually to earn money simple business for these guys. And when they earn money, usually in cash, they somehow need to put it into bank accounts. And finally, they want to be, buy like a big um, houses, villas, uh, cars, yachts, and whatever. And the whole banking system actually uh, is used and supports uh, this, kind of, um, this kind of activities. And like uh, just um, some numbers also, but basically like, it's like about uh, two and a half percent of the overall GDP across the world is, is uh, like dirty money or is like the money that's getting laundered. So like, like, like again, two, two trillion euros, like whatever, like how many now, zeros there are and, and then so like you can calculate, but only less than 1% is being um, caught uh, and detected. So 99% is success rate. So it's a pretty, pretty profitable and pretty reasonable thing to do actually to launder money through the like large banks. Um, like the, you can hear news about Danske Bank, about like HSBC, uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, but also like small, like smallish fintechs. Like there are, if like from the public news, you can see that Revolut uh, CFO stepped back because of the, some funny, like strange things which are happening. Um, N26 uh, was again they weren't guilty, but it's like they were getting under regulatory watching. Um, so many really smart companies are struggling with these kind of things, um, and and that's what we realized that we can help actually them to do because like we have the best people. Um, in the world and best team uh, in the world and it sounds sounds maybe funny But we have the best team because like we, we did it at TransferWise, we did it at Skype and and not too many guys have this kind of experience and that's why we in one hand we we like We're driven by the by the interest to stop the crime and the, to, to cut off this uh, financing financing or the, of the, the cleaning part uh, of the of the process but also we need to do it on the global level because like if we do it only for like five banks in Estonia, then it's like good and maybe maybe profitable business, but it actually doesn't resolve the problem. And vice versa, like if we if we're serving uh, like thousand banks in the world, but if we don't do it effectively and if we're like many companies are focusing uh, on being compliant, like you need to fill some certain requirements that uh, regulators have set up. And if you're hitting them, then you're like good. Uh, and but actually money laundering could still happen. So. That's uh, the trick. So, like, we need to stop the crime, and, and we want to do it um, on the global scale, and that's what's driving us, and that's what's bringing these people together. Um, and what, why I'm talking about that part um, is that, like, um, yeah, one one thing is motivation, but the other thing is that this raises many, many challenging um, problems that that we want to resolve, or we need to resolve actually, and that's where we're losing using um, our like data mining skills um, also for that. So basically, if you're running a simple business, like exchanging money or like, like offering taxi service or like this kind of things, then you ultimately need to optimize like against one KPI, like you want to minimize the cost maybe, or like classical businesses, they want to maximize the profit. Um, you want to maximize the customer happiness or like you select usually single KPI and, and you optimize against that. And it's not, it's not uh, 
easy to optimize, but at least it's easy to, like, reasonably easy to select the target. That, okay, I want to move in that direction. But why the sentiment laundering is that complex is that uh, you have, um, in one hand, you have regulators, like people who are giving out laws, uh, who are checking the banks, um, who are allocating licenses and taking away auditing, and they have some kind of own um, understanding how the money laundering should be prevented. Like, you need to ask um, ID documents, a copy of the ID document, you need to ask, um, like, your home address, um, some document that shows that you're actually from this address. You need to check... Uh, um, from on the paper that okay this what is the business uh, origin country what are the who are the owners um, of the business so like there is a long list of discrete checks and regulators uh, have figured out that actually if you ful fulfill these checks then in theory the like AML risk or money laundering risk should be quite low in practice it doesn't work like that because like criminals know very well how to cheat the documents they can like it's it's no brainer to to build um, some, some nice PDF which says that I'm living here in Tallinn while I'm actually living in somewhere like completely in the middle of nowhere. And, and so that's why like um, in first hand like we need to, like people who are building the AML technologies and products and teams, they need to keep uh, regulators happy and like all, the, all this auditability and, uh, and clarity and, and reliability and these kind of things. Then uh, they actually need to st stop the criminals who are who are really good in creating accounts, like especially in these days, like it's the virtual account creation is getting more and more standard. Uh, and they know very well what are the legal requirements for the banks, and they know also how to bypass. So like in, in second point, like uh, good AML capability includes also like really strong uh, crime detection components. And lastly, definitely, maybe firstly, but lastly, uh, your own customers, like you need to do this um, regulatory checks and also crime detection in a way that, that your good customers don't suffer under that. I, I felt this pain myself. Uh, many, like, uh, I felt uh, when I was responsible for this, um, this, this process uh, back in TransferWise, I, I saw the people who were waiting for after my bad decisions because, like I said, that, okay, let's apply the rule where like, if you're sending more than 15,000 euros, then we need to ask uh, our customers to send the proof of address, which is like copy of the gas bill, basically, or copy of the electricity bill. And, like, I don't have actually these bills myself. Like, how, how the heck I get this? And, like, people, thousands and th thousands of people are, were waiting after my, like, decision that I made because regulators wanted to make, make me to, to make this decision, and I didn't have any better alternatives how to keep customers happy. And when I left TransferWise, I was struggling with my own old team because these guys, like, were stopping my account uh, for, like, Unknown, reason, unknown reasons, and I had to wait uh, while they, they were running this kind of compliance uh, checks. So, like, ultimately, it's not optim like it's like optimization exercise where we need to optimize um, between three um, orthogonal uh, directions, uh, and like usually, like there are always conflicts between them. Like, if I, if I have really really good crime detection then regulators don't buy in because like if, like if I'm running uh, machine learning technologies and really super cool AI, then these guys don't get it. And like they say that a very rule-based approach and like we want to see really transparently why did you make this decision? And, and I don't believe in some kind of deep neural networks or whatever. And um, I had to add some, some formulas at least, sorry. <laughs> Basically, uh, in order to resolve this kind of uh, complex problems, we have um, k kind of some data, like in, in one hand, we're forced to collect a lot of um, information from customers. And that's, that's, in some sense, it's good because like, we have like, names and date of birth and document numbers and copy of the document itself. And um, like, um, also, like, we need to ask, uh, or banks need to ask, like, where did you get your money, actually, or what is the original source? Was it your salary or like, um, a robbery or whatever? Uh, you log all the transactions, uh, in our days fintechs too, but actually banks, old school banks, uh, they kind of also do that, but it's not trivial to get access to that. Um, login data, like when online banks or mobile, mobile applications seeing like from, where, from where and when people are logging in. Um, checking against the global sanctioned list, like US sanctions and political exposed person, like is this person politician or not, uh, in order to, to mitigate some risk of bribery. Uh, like, articles, web search, uh, and so on, and, and so on. So it's like a pretty kind of um, large data set, but it's like always um, 
easy to cheat also. Like if I'm saying that I'm better banned, then how do you check that if I'm actually better banned or not virtually? And and uh, look, these are the input parameters, and uh, and there is kind of the output also, like which is um, I need to decide based on, like based on these these data points, I need to decide whether this person is is like a legit or or is he criminal or like is this person suspicious enough that I should make a report to police? Uh, and also like is this person suspicious enough that regulators might want me to do something with this person? So it's like two different questions always. And and again, the, I need to basically need to fill the fu build a function or several functions f, which actually um, get um, the source data points and, and model like. Uh, should I call, should I report this person to police forces? Or should I, like if police, the police comes to me and asks something about my customer, should I consider this customer as a high risk or like pro problematic for me? Mm, like uh, are other banks asking information from me? Like I have this kind of uh, fragile data points which I can use somehow to train my models or this function f in order to detect the uh, try more faster and more automated way. But it's um, all, always I need to keep in mind these three dimensions. How much time do I left? have left? Okay, good. So now I, I can walk into the some modeling techniques that we're using. Um, actually, we're not using them yet. <laughs> like we are we're still using this uh, simple rule-based approach, like saying that if this person is more than 80 years old and um, if he sends or she sends uh, more than 100,000 euros uh, in two days, which is split into five smaller transactions, then it's something uh, which looks strange. And let's um, let's um, review this customer manually. And that's like uh, that's the level of um, complexity of the rules that most of banks, uh, most of banks in the world are actually using more simpler rules. They're saying if you're sending more than 10,000, then send your some kind of other proof of. Um, uh, of of uh, income or whatever. Like in our case, we're a bit more complex than that. Like we're just defining this kind of lin linear rules, which um, are really easily understandable for the operational people who are actually checking uh, alerts, which are created based on these rules. Like process goes that analyst, data analyst, to define some rules, and these rules uh, start generating um, alerts, which are sent to case management system, where the operational agents are actually taking these alerts and checking, uh, gathering some extra information go from Google, from customer, and deciding is this um, customer suspicious enough that we should report or we should like uh, do some actions with them. And, uh, and the, like, uh, this kind of simple rule set is really easily understandable for the operational agents who kind of know why this alert was created. Because like they they don't want to work with the black box. They they don't want to say that they don't want to see that the okay, score is 99. Please check. But they they actually want to see like what is the behavior or typology behind this and like and like uh, and knowing also that in the past uh, similar behavior has been um, like uh, confirmed as a, as a criminal activity. Um, and secondly, also auditors really like it because like they it's a, like human level. Like if you have been auditor like for 20 years and like. Uh, you have seen these kind of cases like over and over again, then, then it's like very transparent to see it. Okay, old person, 100,000, um, five transaction. Okay, it's suspicious, I agree with you. So it's like a um, human perception which is driving this kind of rule uh, creation. But in real life, actually, um, there is much more we can do. And we are now, as I said, like we have quite many like full time data scientists already working in our team who are building prototypes around the different concepts and they just. Um, take you through some of those. And, and again, like, these are way more difficult than actually, if people have been working in the fraud detection, classical payment fraud, then uh, it's pretty trivial over there. You select some random forest or some deep neural, neural networks and you just, you have some proper training data from the criminal like, uh, reported fraud and then you have like large number of training point, data points and large number of um, like positive and negative cases. And it's like super easy. You put this uh, models on and, and running. But, uh, but here in the AML side, you don't have a good amount of um, like uh, training, like positive labels or like uh, confirmed crime cases, which means that you cannot use too effectively the, uh, the supervised learning. And even unsupervised learning is not useful, but just to walk through this. So basically, it's like um, 
first, first methodologies, just still this using uh, simple uh, decision trees, not random trees, but uh, decision trees, decision trees to, to come, up, come up with a new um, decision, uh, like uh, the typology or the rules. You, you, like, you still have some kind of uh, assumption that they want to see the most extreme users, like who are the oldest or the, the richest or the like, uh, busiest or whatever, and you, you, you train some decision trees around that. That's like, uh, you can do it manually, you don't need to train these decision trees, you can just say that, okay, I'm, I'm selecting that tree and applying it, and that's like fine for the beginning. Mm. The second, uh, second approach is that uh, if you think about the customers of the bank, you have uh, segments of these customers. You have students, you have retired people, you have businessmen, you have some travelers. So like people, like you can spl split or, or like um, map these uh, customers into different segments. And then you would say that, okay, actually there are some people who are falling uh, between those segments, like these guys here. It doesn't mean that they are bad, but, but they are somehow out of the common pattern and, and we should check these people and then validate if they are, maybe they're just unusual customers, but we need to know what these unusual customers are doing. So it's like classical unsupervised learning, uh, you have enough data points and you can, you can train them. Uh, luckily there is some supervised learning also possible. Because like it's um, in some regions, like people are intelligent enough that, that they can say, that, okay, I really believe that this transaction between Mexico and US, like some kind of, U, not, not overall US, but like Mexico and North, Northern part and US uh, Southern states, this transaction, I read, read it from the newspaper that, uh, that this kind of activity is really criminal. And I see these kind of events coming in on, over and over, I report it to, to police and police, Police kind of gives, gives me the hint that yes, it was it was really possibly some drug trafficking going on over there. So like I have some like uh, s segments where I can apply supervised learning, but it doesn't mean that the same behavior can can be applied for the transactions between Malaysia and Australia because like there isn't the drug traf trafficking going on in that direction. So like I need to need to be really conscious conscious of like where I can apply this kind of supervised learning or which regions or which products or which which customer segments. So the next one is um, classical graph min mining. Uh, like how how money laundering is happening is like people each initially you have like um, 10 million dollars and you not need to convert convert it from like Moscow to London. But you split it into small pieces, like you split it into like 100k transactions or like 10k transactions, and different people, different companies, different banks are sending these transactions over many, many countries. But uh, but you still make mistakes. Like, and, and some some level, uh, these um, different users who seem to be completely independent, they actually they have some links. Maybe they were they were using some IP address or some device, or maybe maybe accidentally they used the same bank account. Or, or maybe a similar business name or whatever. So based on this kind of links, we can build a graph. And like if we see that, that some users or some data points are suspiciously close to each other, we can, again, we don't need to decide based on this network itself. The only decision is that like, okay, some human being needs to review it. And that's, uh, that's the AI component that we're still missing uh, for next 10 or 20 years, I'm sure, that how we can like take the, this, um, like we can train easily this kind of network um, graph-based graph models which suggest that someone would need to take a look at this case more closely and ask more information from the client and Google and, and apply the historical knowledge. And at this point, uh, theoretically, yes, some proper artificial intelligence can help to do that. But so far, it's like impossible. It's like uh, still much easier and cheaper and reachable to hire smart people who, who review it. Mm. Then, like a uh, constant fluctuation, or like if I said that um, banks are checking um, people who are exceeding, let's say, whose transaction is, is exceeding 15,000 euros. So criminals also figure that out, okay, there is a, some kind of threshold at 15K, so I do like uh, 14,999, or I do maybe 13,999,000, and uh, I, I'm trying to cheat those, uh, those fixed thresholds. So again, like, but we can actually, um, build the models uh, which are testing or checking transactions which are, like, at least which are monitoring transactions or behaviors which are flying under the radar and not too closely under the radar, but like which, which seem to be like intentionally um, 
trying to cheat this, this fixed threshold system. So again, like, um, there isn't uh, uh, proper training data or there aren't uh, confirmed labels, but at least we can see that if, if the frequency of uh, some kind of transactions which, is like, which are slightly below the fine threshold is happening, then it kind of suggests that okay, something fishy might, might be going on over there. Yeah, yeah, thank you, I'm done almost. And then lastly, again, it's like name, name search or text, text mining. People are writing, if you're sending a bank transfer to your friend, then you need to write down the reference, uh, some explanation why this, uh, this transaction is happening. If you're writing down the PTC or, or some ug other ugly words, then again, this text mining, or if you're, if you're saying that like a gun, a guns for my friends, or it's usually a joke, but like uh, quite often it's not a joke like when the money is going to terrorists or like I'm paying for my drugs. Like uh, it's a cool fun, but actually in some cases it's not a fun actually, and it's not a joke. So finding this kind of, um, not the keywords, but actually like, uh, like buzzwords. Uh, also comparing names, uh, like you know previously known criminals, like if I have a random name, uh, like uh, Ahmed, uh, Mohammed, um, uh, which is my customer and it's, it's a good, Good, good client, but actually I know that the American government has uh, sanctioned all the Ahmeds, like all Mohammeds, uh, not all, but actually names are pretty similar and I need to measure the text similarity between these names. And, and I need to decide, is it um, close enough to trigger another check or to, to trigger another investigation? So all, all of these and then of course like many other like machine learning technologies are the ones that were using already and we're like, um, extending the use of those as, as we grow our business. Like currently we're just uh, starting. We have, um, as I said, like we have the team team and uh, I can say this slide, but basically a team who knows how to do that and we're testing with the early, early, like very early phase uh, clients or, or like companies who, who really want to not only use it, use it, but actually who want to give a feedback and who are like, kind of sharing the same mission. And, uh, and yeah, like as we acquire more customers, uh, then we get more data that we can analyze and then we can ex extend um, the use of this kind of different, more complex rules. And ultimately in the end, like if, uh, if we're like large enough, then hopefully at one day, like this crime detected uh, is not anymore 1%, but it's like 2% and 3%, 5% and so on. So that's the, that's the stuff that we're doing. Okay, but I think I've completed. Thank you. That's a classical question. It's not related to data, directly to data, but it's more related to the, the classical um, startup um, sales and pitch. Like I need to, I need to win some early phase customers uh, who are like, um, like early stage fintechs who are not that worried about my prestige, but who are worried about the product that I'm offering. If I get into my portfolio some little names, then in the next round I'm acquiring some bigger names uh, to my portfolio that they can use reference. I'm building my brand, uh, like I'm giving talks like that, uh, also like, like meeting people in London, attending in the, in the hackathons with the really big names and big banks, so being part of the com community, so it's classical business sales exercise for them. Well, it's like we need to apply for the shock too, basically, uh, to sh show and to be actually compliant with the like, procedural requirements and so on, so that's, this is, this is probably, it's not the most difficult, it's, it's still something that people have done before, but, uh, but yeah, like, like if, if our competitors are like uh, Oracle, SAS, um, uh, the, the Lloyd and this kind of big guys, then uh, coming somewhere from like Eastern Europe, data miner, what the heck are you doing? So it's, it is difficult, I agree. Hello, um, my question is about the data. So you, uh, I understand you're building your technology at this moment. Uh, you mentioned several algor algorithms uh, for segmentation and for AML, you know, trans transaction monitoring, etc. Can you tell us something about your data sets that you are using right now 
to create the algorithms and, and, and know that they're working and offer this to, to the customers, to your first customers. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. We uh, actually generated our own, we call it fake bank, uh, or synthetic data that we generated ourselves, again, data science team. Uh, thanks to the fact that we have been working in the fintechs and banks ourselves, we kind of are able to verbally describe segments uh, like user table, transaction table, login table, different um, customer type typologies. Uh, thanks to the like AML people that we have in the team, they are able to verbalize what are the criminal activities. So this, uh, the fake bank data itself is like um, <laughs> kind of almost product product we can start selling. But it's like it's not the main goal. But but we have like really large bank which is like fake, but still, and this bank is using our technology uh, on, on the SaaS platform, and and we are able to build the uh, rules. We are able to test the machine learning algorithms over there. So it's like. Uh, uh, one way forward. And of course, like, we're giving this fake bank along with our technology, or along with our product uh, for the potential customers also, so they can play it, play around like in the open sandbox. So like, in, the, in case of the business sales, it's, uh, it's really hard to get into contract if they haven't actually touched uh, your, your technology. So like, having this um, like, um, data which is fairly similar to real life, um, it's actually quite helpful for both for ourselves, but also for the potential clients. Thank you. We can take uh, one question here from this speaker. Excuse me. Uh, hey, the question is, uh, how do you label AML cases? I don't know. <laughs> like that, that, that is the diff most difficult part uh, because, like, it's uh, if um, a transfer wise, like we had a team of very smart people who really focused on finding crime, and they, based on their best knowledge, if they decided that this particular customer or like a group of customers is suspicious enough that they want to report it to police in UK or Singapore or, or US, then this team itself believed that, okay, there is something really fishy going on. So it wasn't confirmed, but for me and for data guys, it was like sufficient confirmation that, okay, we should try to search other similar cases. And of course, like we never knew whether these cases went into court. Okay, in some very rare cases, you can actually see that, uh, know that they are, they are sent into court. And sometimes people were asked uh, to go into this court uh, process and like, to, to be uh, like a fitness, fi fi whatever, Tunista. <laughs> uh, and, um, but, but in real life, like uh, if you have a million customers and you kind of assume that uh, there are maybe 10,000 guys who are trying to cheat and launder their money and you're getting labels only for 10 of them or five of them or two of them, then, then that's, um, this is a problem. And this is not a problem only for us, but all the banks are begging uh, regulators and police forces, could you please give us some feedback? And the only feedback they, they get is that, yeah, like annually we get uh, 300,000 reports from financial institutions and um, some of them are correct ones. And that's it, like basically. And that's like where the industry has to figure out what are the methodologies, how to train and label. But they're, they're like reading news, like uh, cases like this um, uh, laundromat, uh, which was like, coming from Russia and Moldova and Estonia and Latvia. So again, reading, thinking about your own product, your own customers, and just trying to imagine how something similar could happen in my customer base, and then checking. So that, that's uh, that's why I said like there isn't uh, training data, there isn't. Uh, direct way to optimize uh, the process. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, are you going to stay around until then? Yes. 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 We have a networking uh, break at the end of the talk, so then please ask questions and approach Tavi again. But uh, from North AI, Super Angels, and the crowd, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>
and I'm going to tell you what is Hugo Legal and what we are doing. So <clears throat> basically, Hugo Legal is uh, a platform where lawyers and the customers uh, meet. And uh, to put it simple, then it's uh, Uber for lawyers. Uh, so uh, uh, where they provide us their services and the customers can meet. Uh, why we are doing it? Uh, I have been uh, engaged with this uh, venture about two and a half years. So what we have found out is that actually there is 80% of the market which is unserved. And the reason is that uh, the legal industry uh, is too expensive for most of us. And you still have this kind of habit of thinking that if there is a legal problem, then some, guy, some uh, possible way I will go through without engaging any lawyers. I think it's wrong. Uh, I think uh, you should uh, get the answer to your legal question in the very beginning. And that's why uh, we are doing it. So uh, it's obvious that if you look at the number of the lawyers which are in the world right now, then we can't serve all the 80% because there are too few lawyers. So obviously we need to bring in some technology, obviously we need to bring in some, some uh, workarounds so that same number of lawyers could serve uh, the amount of people who are out there and crying for legal help. <coughs> so. Uh, as said, uh, there is no access, from client side, there is no access to lawyers. I don't know uh, how many people have had a relation or contact to a lawyer for some specific reason. Okay, and uh, how many of you did have uh, this lawyer, uh, uh, did you pay for it or it was your friend? How many did pay, how many did pay for it? Okay, much less hands, you see? So, most likely you went for, for your friend, or most likely you looked up somebody uh, who, is, uh, who could help you. But actually, uh, it might, you might come to the situation where this kind of short help didn't help you out, and finally uh, you run into a problem uh, in, the, in the end. Uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, that's the reason. So from uh, this lawyer's side, uh, lawyers don't have uh, very nice tools what they could use to work efficiently. So, efficiently. so basically, they can't serve as many customers as they want. As written here, then uh, their average uh, billable time is 40%. Uh, with Hugo, the lawyers, are mostly working on their cases, so they don't have to worry about uh, customer acquisition or some uh, invoicing or some other problems. They mainly work on their cases, and this way their time is, I dare to say, at least 90% billable. Uh, so, I, so we give quick access to legal help for people, and we give hassle-free tools. I would like to do one test here, but I don't know how can, if it's doable, or can I switch to Chrome here? Uh, because I don't want to show only slides. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And if I fail, then I, I stop this. I don't want to spend too much time from my presentation for this. Uh, but let's see. Okay. Hugo dot. Legal. I don't want to show just the presentation. I want to show you what we have been working on so that you understand uh, uh, fully. So this is our website. And uh, uh, we uh, what you can do here is you can already uh, ask legal help. <coughs> Basically, in Estonia, if I want to marry, uh, I can ask, because we have taught this uh, um, uh, robot lawyer to answer family law questions. So uh, I can type, 
Uh, I want to marry. I want to marry. So, and uh, what's wrong? Uh, what was the joke? I, I, okay, you can tell me afterwards. Um, so, and uh, easily I can find out uh, and I can trust the system as we have worked through all those answers. So, uh, let's say I, uh, I want to apply for a custody. I want to apply for custody. Then also, uh, it, it, should be, uh, it should be able to answer. Uh, and uh, and this, is, uh, this is what we have found out. Quite many people who come into our office who think they have very special question and only this person has this, uh, they actually have very similar questions. So what we have done is we are answering your initial questions fast. We do it for free. Uh, our goal is that we, we try to make you think differently. We, we believe that uh, if you ask your question today in this legal field for three euros, it's cheaper for you than wait for two years and then find out that, okay, it's going to cost me 10,000, 5,000 euros. Uh, so basically, we are changing the market this way that we want to make you ask uh, you those questions. We give it for free, and then uh, if it's going deeper, then you can book a lawyer. Uh, I think I have to just refresh it right now. So uh, there is a possibility to ask a free question for a law from a lawyer, and after that, if you have more questions, then we we you match you with a lawyer, and that's it. So now let's hope my. Computer skills are still there. Where is my presentation? Okay. So, um, oh, okay, this is uh, another tab that we have to switch to. Okay, sorry, I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice. And it's correct slide. Uh, so, where are we? Uh, uh, we are profitable in Estonia. We have acquired already 20,000 plus customers. Uh, we have made uh, uh, 1.6 uh, million of total sales. And uh, we have uh, 50 plus active lawyers in our network. Uh, we are entering Polish market right now. So Arthur, our CEO, is in uh, Warsaw and is uh, uh, doing hard work there in order to go to the market. And uh, we have l helped a lot of people. Uh, uh, just uh, over 1,000 plus people we have helped about uh, the debt collectors uh, who are approaching with, uh, with their papers. <laughs> So uh, our robot lawyer has helped, it, helped those people for free in order to answer and in order to avoid these steps. So, uh, and how we are doing it? So we, uh, as I said, we, there must be some technology applied because the same amount of number of people can't serve this uh, uh, need in the market, actually. Uh, of course, this means that prices will come down uh, uh, from the other end because we, we are giving uh, things what uh, the, the people have been used to pay for. We are giving away it for free. But, uh, but from the other side, uh, you will have uh, lots of answers. Uh, and uh, we will apply uh, artificial intelligence uh, doing that. So uh, today, what you saw in our website, it is very simple thing. It's uh, uh, basically the, uh, the dialogue flow and all the other things that uh, where we train our uh, dialogue flow to uh, ask 
to answer different questions. So it's, uh, it means uh, that uh, when user has some kind of question, then there will be a query, as you saw, I asked, uh, I want to marry. Actually, it can answer also if you want to divorce. So, and, uh, and then we uh, find out that what is the actual topic, what, uh, what uh, the person uh, is uh, looking for, and then we have some code which can generate the answer, and that's it. Uh, I think as m uh, quite many of you have been working on AI, then it, there, is something new, there is nothing new in this slide for you. Uh, uh, but this is where we are actually standing with Hugo. Uh, that uh, uh, it is that simple, but it must go much deeper. Uh, uh, because uh, only answering uh, one or another question is not helping uh, people fully. We need to, under, if we want to understand the full context of this person, I mean, uh, uh, we want to know actually what kind of other questions you should answer so that you get your, uh, uh, your situation solved, then uh, we need to teach the AI to ask those questions. We, uh, so, for example, if I start asking uh, for a divorce, then uh, might, there might be answers also wanted uh, that about children. What will happen with children? How, how we divide the custody of the children and so on. So we, we can help people from that. This is how we save time from the lawyers in order to take care of um, some of the things what AI can't take care of today. Um, then I am, uh, yes, wait. Question. How do you collect uh, feedback from uh, customers uh, after talk with a lawyer? Because it's very important for labeling your data for training mm -hmm. in future. Yes, uh, uh, so question was how do we collect data or, or how to collect questions? So uh, do you mean, uh, basically they uh, come to us with question. How do you collect uh, uh, some uh, labels for these questions? For example, I ask, uh, ask question to your lawyer, I get answer, and said, "Okay, this answer is not. I don't like it, so I just uh, move to other platform or to uh, other lawyer okay. and ask the same questions. How do you collect this? Because this information is needed for you for your models for future." Uh, uh, it's labeling so of your data. Uh, uh, oh, oh. Okay, lay, okay. Uh, I don't know, I don't understand which data you want to label. Incoming data or outgoing data? Measuring okay, measuring satisfaction. Okay, it's another thing. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we just guarantee or we go through all the answers so that we know that they are adequate in this uh, uh, country. So, if you get this answer, then most likely you're satisfied. If uh, if your question is that, do I really uh, measure it in our system right now? No. Uh, but uh, in, the, uh, in our administration side, we do it manually. So once for a while, we uh, go and we just write an email where you're satisfied with the service, and this is how we get feedback. You're right, this must be done in future, it must be done automatically. So, uh, yes. Uh, now, we are using, as it was mentioned, we are using TensorFlow also, and uh, I have uh, also two internship students here who have been working a lot uh, with uh, other field, which is not question answer question answer. But this summer they were working in in this area where they were trying. T these are law students and uh, they know something about IT. So they worked uh, on this uh, thread uh, that uh, we would, where we would like to make the AI to study the law and to understand your behavior from the law, if it was legal or not. So uh, uh, during the mingling session, feel free to approach and ask more about this one. I'm not going to uh, go too deep here. Uh, uh, I, I think the results were interesting, but maybe not too promising for, for the initial work, but it was only three months, so you can't expect too much uh, also. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, what's what's in the future? Uh, so definitely, we have to build uh, some kind of uh, what is it now called uh, a character of the AI, so that it will be friendly, it will be nice to you, uh, or it will be scientific. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then uh, we have to build a dialogue development, which means that, as I said, we need to build. Uh, we need to control the flow of the dialogue, and AI has to do it. Uh, this way, we really can build a model from the person, and then we can understand the situation, and we can really uh, understand if AI could help uh, him or her, or if uh, uh, there is specifically a help from a lawyer needed. Uh, and uh, this means that we have to do automatic matchmaking, uh, right now, it's an administrator who, who does the matchmaking, who finds uh, a suitable lawyer for you. Uh, after we have seen uh, uh, some answers to the questions, and uh, and I think uh, this is the very beginning of it. As I said, uh, uh, we believe that it is possible to build an AI which is which uh, takes a look at the law, uh, and then. Uh, detect if you're acting by the law or against the law. So, shortly, this is it from me. Uh, uh, this is Hugo Legal. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions uh, from me or from our website. Uh, feel free to, to come to me. If you feel that this is a very interesting topic for you, we are also, I'm looking uh, for people into my team who would like to develop AI from one or another uh, uh, direction. Uh, so I think there is lots of data mining coming up. There is uh, lots of other stuff what we will have to do in order to, to uh, come uh, even more successful than we have been right now. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one, two questions. Does anyone? No? Oh, okay. So basically, you use uh, something like Dialog4 from Google now, and you want to produce your own IE. How are you going to do it? What is your plan? Like, what is next? Uh, yes. Basically, the roadmap is that we are using. Uh, uh, existing uh, platforms uh, for AI for a while, and uh, and within three years we we move away from those existing platforms. As I said, TensorFlow, uh, Dialogflow, and all those uh, things mixed up together, and this is what we are doing right now. But we have partners who are eager to develop the artificial intelligence language, natural language processing, and everything for us. So. Uh, that's the future. Yes? Yes? You need to take a lot of uh, like, uh, feedback. feedback, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Uh, I just want to know uh, how long did it take you to develop your own, your own AI? Uh, this AI, uh, uh, well, I think it was. Uh, as as you understand, we are using existing platforms also, so it uh, it was more the training part than the the actually de development of the neural network and understanding different uh, technologies. So this has taken uh, training and all together, I think half a year or so. Uh, but going deeper, it will take longer. <laughs> so for sure. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Mart and Hugo Legal. We all wish you good luck in the future. Thank you. Uh, and we continue. I, uh, 
I welcome you to ask a lot of questions from uh, Kaspar Kikkerbil. He's from Lumabot or Lumbot. I heard a new, uh, new word yesterday, Lumbot. So they are making robots. So we have a new robot in town. Uh, we have Starship and now Lumbot. Why don't you tell us why you made a new robot? What can you do and what have been your uh, challenges until today? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Casper. I'm the co-founder of Lumbot. Uh, we had an event here just yesterday. So how many of you attended? I uh, see a few similar faces. Yeah, cool. So uh, like you said, we build street cleaning robots that happen to be autonomous. So why are we doing it? Well, there is a problem. Uh, you see, the growth of the cities really doesn't allow the current service model to really continue. What I mean here is we have more pollution and more requirements for the cleanliness of the streets than ever. And uh, there is no manual labor that actually wants to do the job. So what's happening at the moment is these companies that are handling this, they're hiring more and more managers because they need to keep up with the constant in and outflow of manual laborers. So the service is becoming more and more inefficient to run, uh, which is why there's a need for an alternative, uh, which robots present us. Now, if you're able to give a really specific task to a robot, we can do that. So let's talk about a robot. So you can see here, this is a sketch. This is what we, where we want to be. You can see actually the robot that we have soon. Uh, all of our robots were here yesterday as well. Uh, so what we're building is autonomous uh, st like street cleaning robots that are more than 10 times cheaper to use than the machinery you use today. Now this is the key here, because first of all, these robots are cheaper to make. And secondly, you don't need any manual labor to actually run it. The whole key here, as with most of the technology that is using AI, is that you make it efficient as possible. So we, are, of course, are not 100% autonomous, nor ever will be. But uh, we are able to really uh, well dissect when we need human interactions. So you don't need one robot, like one person for one robot. You can have one person managing hundreds and hundreds of robots if a robot is very good at telling you when uh, it needs assistance. So that's, that's the key here. So a little bit about markets as well, so you get the better picture. What we're really going after is the Northern Europe, uh, more specifically Scandinavia, Canada, and Northern America in the long run. Uh, we do see a lot more potential in the future in different markets as well. Uh, for instance, we've been approached by farms uh, who want our robot there to push uh, food for cows. Uh, very similar to snow, cleaning, like snow removal, but it's just cow food. So there's a lot of interesting applications there because it is a big platform as a robot. So here is, no, that's traction, sorry, I missed the slide. Uh, so we already we started uh, exactly one year ago. Uh, it was as part of a competition where we had to build a snow removal robot. That sort of grew into a whole startup uh, where we started taking on new challenges. And within the course of one year, we built three different robots and we're gonna have additional four by November from which street are going to serve uh, paying customers. Uh, further than that, we are also talking with uh, the city of Tallinn uh, for even a larger plan. And more important than that, we have traction from all over Scandinavia, and more notably from Toronto, uh, because of Google is planning their massive smart city, and they want us to come by. So uh, this is one of our prototypes. Uh, it was here yesterday, like I said. This is a 250 kilogram uh, robot. So it's a lot bigger than Starship, weighs a lot more. Uh, the production version that is going to be ready uh, for this November is actually 500 kilograms. So it's a tank. <laughs> There's a, it literally is a tank, uh, which is scary, of course, and uh, awesome at the same time. Uh, so the main thing here is that we are able to put, uh, like, have the robots on the site 24-7. This is what really creates the efficiency, because even though the robot is half a ton, it can't push a lot of snow. The big machines used today can push tons and tons of snow. These robots just can't. There is physics involved. So what we are doing is, because we're on the site all the time, we start working when we need to. So for instance, during winter, when it's snowing, we start working right away. Whatever time it is, we start removing snow. So there is never a situation where the snow is knee high or just above the grade of the robot. During summertime, uh, we're doing street cleaning, doing these kinds of tasks that are also done manually, and they're more periodic, because you don't have that extreme weather conditions during the summertime. But of course, with the current climate, you never know. Um, so 
Uh, just if anyone's interested, this is our uh, pricing model. So we, because our plan is to go after the manual labor, so we have priced ourselves as one. This is a fully uh, based on the service model. So we are just taking the same fee that a minimal uh, labor worker would get, but the difference is different markets pay differently. Hence, we want to go outside of Estonia. Uh, so, uh, this is our team. We have a team of nine. Uh, so, three of us are working full time on it. Uh, others are working full time and other jobs, uh, which is always fun when you start a startup. Uh, this is the founders team, and we have five more uh, in total for our team of nine. So, what we really have is mostly uh, software developers, mechanical engineers, and mechatronics who do electronics and uh, mechanics both, and the product designer. So, uh, but this is the part that you guys are most interested about. So let's talk a little bit more about our software. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens when you're building an autonomous robot. Because the main three things that our customers want to see is that it calculates efficient work patterns, that it learns about the area and the obstacles, and that it can work in a fleet. So this is what the customers want to see. They don't really care about anything else. They just want to know it works, it learns, it's smart. That's it. Well, in reality, it's a lot different. So just a, like the small thing alone, like when should a robot start working, is a really complex operation. Because we can see when it starts snowing. But to actually get to a point where we can tell the robot it's snowing involves a lot of things. So we are using at the moment, uh, or we are going to use from uh, this November, data from um, the smart uh, sensors that were placed around Tallinn, about 900 of them. So we are analyzing the weather conditions uh, and looking if we're able to like, tell it's snowing based off that. And secondly, we're doing uh, video analysis as well, on, opposed to uh, predetermined times, which is also happening for certain locations, but we need to be able to determine it ourselves. So for video alone, this is what happens. Uh, we do a pixel analysis. This is very simple. It's not. Uh, diagram I made myself, but it's the same logic. So I just pulled that off the internet, but this is what's actually happening in order to determine if it's snowing. This is not overly complex, but I'm just saying like even the smallest thing is already more complex than, than it should be in some cases. But then let's go on. So positioning. In order to work, you need to understand where you are. And we've done a lot of different things in order to understand how we position ourselves. Because for us, it's not good enough if you're able to tell that, hey, I'm around here within the accuracy of 10 centimeters. If you're pushing snow or cleaning the street and you miss 10 centimeters, you're going to have a big problem because there's a lot of snow that can pile up there and it can cause problems. Or you can just leave some parts of the street unclean. Uh, and these, these can have like, uh, long-term effects as well. So we are trying different things. We're using GPS, a more accurate version of GPS, GPS uh, uh, like cor data correction algorithms as well. There's different startups that actually work on that, that we use their services. But this is still not good enough, because in the cities, the GPS is not really good. So what we're using is we're using the SLAM algorithm, uh, which really means that we are driving around, scanning the roads and streets and uh, our areas with uh, stereo cameras. Fun. Um, yeah. Let me just quickly do that. Are we back? Good. So this is what we're doing. We're driving around. We're scanning uh, what's around us. And that allows us to position us a lot more accurately uh, than with GPS. What we are waiting for is Bluetooth 5.1. Uh, well, we're not waiting for it. It's already available, but it's not available in the city. So what this actually helps us to do at one point is triangulate. Uh, old technology that is coming back with this. Uh, with this, you're able to uh, like position yourself uh, within the accuracy of one centimeter. They're pretty inexpensive, but it's going to take some time until it gets, becomes available, because you're able to actually calculate the angles and all of those things really, really accurately, which is going to drive the really big leap forward with the autonomous vehicles. Yeah, so this messed up. Um, Cool. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what we've done. So this is our first version of the software. This is the stupidest thing we've ever done. And uh, it's the most fun one thing we've ever done. So what we first wanted to do is like take a helicopter view and really position ourselves on the map there. So in order to do that, we started tracking the reddest object on the screen, which in this case happens to be a MyFitness towel. Uh, and it's doing that very well. 
Now, this worked for a very short period of time because we realized, first of all, we can't get access to security cameras for our clients. Uh, most of them don't want to give us that access for obvious reasons, and you can't cover the whole area with security cameras. So we had to start doing this kind of things. So this is a, on a big screen, it's a lot worse. <laughs> but this is a, once a robot has driven by this area once. So what we have here is different data points. And uh, these data points really tell us the depth as well. And it's able to really position uh, the objects on the map really easily. So above you can see our parking lot and we've driving, like after driving around it once. And now every time it does a route, it's going to improve that. And from that data, we're able to tell what is there permanently and what is there, what is there a car, what is there a new object that we can just like, not include at that time. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any questions, feel free uh, to raise your hand. Go. Uh, so there's, it, well, there's, um, there's uh, companies that sort of offer it as a service as well. Uh, so there's two parts. It depends on what kind of GPS unit you're using. And then there's the part of uh, correcting the GPS data. So these two things have to work hand in hand, and then you can have it. However, with GPS, it's only possible in very good weather conditions and if you're not surrounded by houses where it can reflect off. So it's rather rare. Uh, in the city, it's not that difficult to get a situation where it's like 5 to 10 centimeters uh, of accuracy. But for us, it's not com like good enough. We need something that is more accurate. But it helps us. Uh, it's always good backup. And we still have, we still have it but we most rely on the video one. Uh, and everything we do always has two different kind of sensors measuring it, and they make a decision based of uh, two reads. That's, that's how we do things. One is always trusted more, but if there is a case where they need to decide. Uh, so let's talk about work patterns. So here is, so we, everybody knows a vacuum cleaner that is a robot, a Roomba, however you want to call it. So a big revolution there was when it, it first was doing this. It was just running about, uh, just pumping into the walls and going the other way. And then it started mapping the rooms. And now it could do it really smartly, which is awesome. Uh, it was a really big leap forward for uh, the vacuum cleaners. For us, it's a lot more difficult. So let me explain. So it is a very simplistic uh, area of a parking lot. Now, when we get assigned a parking lot, we have given different places where we can place snow, snow mountains. So wherever we are on the, uh, on the map, we need to calculate our way to the closest or most suitable uh, place we can put snow. Now, when it becomes difficult is different areas can hold different amounts of snow. So this is also something you need to keep in mind. So if you're driving, like planning the route around, you need to keep in mind where you're end, like leaving the snow in the end. So this is already a lot different than the Roomba, because we are not just driving around, we are pushing things in front of us. Now, if snow is higher or there's a problem, you need to stop and recalculate your path halfway. So let's say we want to do this track here. Uh, again, oversimplified at this point, but let's say you want to do this track here. And we've estimated that there's too much snow, the robot can't push it. So what we have to do now is stop somewhere here, record that it stopped somewhere around here, drive around it, come to halfway point, and try it from here if you can push the entire snow here then have it to come back. So you constantly have to position yourself on the map, understand what areas you've cleaned, where you have problems, and sort of estimate what you have to do in actually, to actually complete the job. So there's a lot of calculations and recalculations happening at the same time. And this is differentiation between all the other uh, robotics companies out there, because we have to deal with that stuff. So now working as a fleet, there's different ways, and this is something that we are trying to figure out at the moment. Should we have identical robots that can just work at, have their own designated areas, and once the work is completed, they're going to go and help, if possible? Or should we have highly specialized robots that do very specific tasks? So this way, you're actually going to make the work more efficient, but you can't be a, a lot, in a lot of places at the same time. And this is really something that we have to figure out through testing and through understanding, but it's a big question because 
you have to sort of assign roles to each robot. And like, it's really difficult to put them together to work in the fleet. Again, good mapping is the key, because you need to understand what the area is clean, regardless of if you go with specialized robots or not. And by specialized robots, I mean that one robot is pushing snow, and the other one is just throwing it into a pile. At the moment, we have just robots that are just pushing and a little bit lifting the snow up. But we could have a specialized robot that is designated to go into a spot, and it just throws snow up into the mountain. So we can position more snow into one location. But there's a lot of other stuff as well we need to figure out in order to actually do it. When is a parking lot clean? Uh, this is something that, again, if you plow snow, or clean the street, or do whatever you want, you understand if your work is complete. With the robot, it's really difficult to measure if we have cleaned enough snow, or was it like this before? So, because snow starts to pack up, or if you're cleaning the street, at what level is the dust acceptable and not? Because you can't take constant samples. How much snow is there? This is for, lo it, this is for logistics reasons, uh, because like I said, you have designated areas, you need to understand when you need to order uh, bigger trucks to remove the snow, all of these parts, you need to understand the volume. Uh, what season it is? Well, this is a big question. In Estonia, in December, it can be plus 15 or it can be minus 15. Very different applications you need to run. Now, a machine has to decide, is it all or is it winter? And again, you have to make these decisions because a robot can have different things in front, the mechanical vacuum cleaner or a snow plow. So it has to decide what application I'm using today and why. And uh, lastly, how far can a robot go? I mean, you know that your battery range for us, we, oh, I know that the battery range for us is two hours. We can drive for two hours, and then we need to charge for two, 20 minutes, and then we can drive for two hours again. Now, we can't always predict the weather conditions that are ahead of us after 30 minutes, and if we are able to like, plan the journey and all of those things. So there's a lot of things we still have to learn, and a lot of things that are ahead of us. But luckily, none of this matters. It's all irrelevant. Because what matters is safety. Uh, we can't apply any of these technologies before our robots are safe. Like I said, our robots weigh 500 kilograms. There is no way that after 12 months of developing it, we are letting them run loose in their city. So what we're doing is we're just running all those systems and just driving them manually until we have enough testing hours and enough that we're comfortable enough to actually trust them enough. They have to prove to us first that they are capable of working. And uh, this is what we do. We just uh, do different kinds of tests. We do real tests as well, but I mean, these are robots and they're meant to be fun. Uh, so we make sure we have fun with them as well. And uh, that's about it. Yeah, do you have any questions? With Talim, we're talking about the pedestrian roads only. So we're not talking about uh, drivers, uh, like the big roads you drive with your cars on, because these robots are meant to go, not meant to go at that speed. Uh, and a low, like the pedestrian roads alone that are in the city of Tallinn is 1.5 square uh, million, 1.5 million square meters. Uh, and one robot at the moment can handle about 45,000. Four to five thousand, not forty-five thousand, four to five thousand. So it's a lot of robots that the city of Tallinn would need. So we're more thinking strategically here. What are the areas that need to be clean? But at the moment, the current service providers can't really go there. Uh, the second part of the question was how do we predict uh, 
like if we're able to take this task on. So what we're doing is we're offering our clients different SLAs. So we're saying we know that on average, uh, like winter time, this is how much it snows. In these situations, uh, the like the peak of the snowfall is this amount of centimeters per 24 hours, and uh, our robot can easily clean that area. Now, if you want to have a larger area, we cannot guarantee the same service level agreement uh, as with the smaller area. So this is how we do it. We just present the facts and we just say what the robot is meant to do and then the client can decide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Kaspar and Liumbat. Let's give another applause for you. Right there. So now we have heard the story of a fintech, legal tech, autonomous cars. What's missing is media. And as you know, every startup, would every AI startup would like to have an ML engineer who has a PhD. And Otto Kartilk from Snackable AI has a PhD. So they're so lucky to have him. Snackable AI is nothing to do with snacks, I guess. Why don't you come on, come on here on the stage and tell us what you do? And as you are a machine learning engineer, Definitely, please ask a lot of questions from that guy during the talk. Raise a hand. Go ahead. Have fun. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, as you heard, my name is Otakar, and this is really my name. And I'm a machine learning engineer at Snackable. So today, I'm here to talk about uh, one of our main consumer-facing products, which is uh, audio search engine. Uh, and by audio, I don't mean uh, uh, music, but rather spoken uh, word content like uh, podcasts, news, audiobooks, interviews, things like that. And uh, the second main product we have is, is uh, based on uh, audio content summarization or snack generation, as we called it. And that's actually where, where our name comes from. So now you know that. But I'm not going to talk about it, about it that, uh, about that today uh, because my my teammate Alex already talked about it uh, at North Star AI conference this spring. Are there any people who already saw that talk? Yep. Nope. All right. Yeah, and I'm sure that there will be more chances to talk about that part of the of our startup. So, but coming back to uh, audio search engine, uh, it's becoming increasingly relevant problem to find relevant content, uh, audio content, as uh, there are millions of hours content already available, and and more is recorded every day. And also, uh, the number of of podcast consumers is growing rapidly and is higher than ever before. Uh, voice systems, mega systems like like Alexa and and Google Home are taking over our homes, cars and phones. So, there's definitely a growing market for products that enable finding relevant needles from this growing haystack. However, uh, finding relevant audio content still remains a notoriously difficult task. Uh, it's um, uh, not easy. It, it, compared to um, text and, and images and even video, it's much harder to search for and browse. Well, let's say you are interested in machine learning and want to learn about it. You might be able to find the relevant uh, episode, but still, you have to skip through it and seek for the relevant parts to uh, actually verify if, if uh, this episode is interesting enough for you. And. Uh, Usually, users just stick to the first thing that they find or what they have heard about. So lots of quality content remains undiscovered. And we at Snackable want to change that. So our goal is to take you directly to the relevant content, relevant segments in episodes, uh, and skip all irrelevant parts. So if you are searching for machine learning, then we don't just give you the relevant episodes, but allow you to listen to only the segments that talk about actually machine learning. And this has two benefits. First of all, of course, you can find things faster and, and decide if you want to full, listen to the full episode and don't waste time on things that 
turn out to be actually not interesting at all. But maybe even more interestingly, it enables uh, new use cases. For example, instead of listening to full episodes, you might want to just listen to uh, segments that discuss the topic of interest across different episodes and series. So you get different viewpoints and, and uh, more thorough um, overview of, of, of the field. So now the question is, how, how did we build this system and what kind of challenges did you face when building it? Well, the first challenge is converting audio into text. Although it's uh, only a challenge if you decide to uh, deploy and maintain your own automatic transcripts system, because, well, it's, uh, the field is developing quite quick, quickly and, and basically you have to, to, to keep up to date, you have to constantly improve it. Uh, we at Snackable decided to take a slightly simpler approach, so we decided to uh, uh, use it as a service from a service provider, so we can uh, focus on, on things that uh, actually make us unique. Although uh, uh, the service can be a bit pricey, it's currently the most expensive part of a pipeline. Uh, it's still getting cheaper as competition is increasing. For example, compared to last year, we are now paying like 30% less. And finally, uh, the third reason why we decided to use a service provider for that is that the quality of transcripts uh, is the foundation uh, for, uh, for the success of the entire pipeline. So it's really difficult to compete with companies that's, uh, that have the main focus on uh, good quality ASR. Uh, once we have the transcript, we run into slightly more unique challenges. So we noticed that uh, transcripts, unlike uh, text documents and web pages, lack uh, structure. So at the lowest level, um, we want to have punctuation and capitalization, because otherwise downstream NLP components uh, don't work well enough. And just as importantly, it's very difficult to read and understand transcripts that don't have punctuation and capitalization. At a slightly higher level, we can see that unlike text documents and web pages, transcripts do not have paragraphs or chapters that outline uh, topic boundaries. And this is also important, especially for search, because when you find uh, uh, results that mention your search phrase, you need enough context to actually verify if it's uh, talking about the topic of interest sufficiently enough. And this, of course, one solution is to just use a fixed window of sentences around the mention, but this often uh, doesn't really provide good enough context because it can start from a confusing place and end abruptly. So we want to have a context where, where, um, uh, where basically the text that you have around the mention is, is uh, a self-contained and informative piece of text that is also actually very nice to listen. And thirdly, um, to get a quicker overview of search results, it's really useful to highlight uh, the key words and phrases in each segment or paragraph, as you may call it. So basically, these are the first set of challenges, and they don't end here. Once we have recovered the structure of, of the audio file in the transcript, we notice that uh, not all the parts of the, of the audio file are uh, equally relevant. For example, on one hand, we have uh, segments that discuss the central topic or have the um, main guest speaking. But on the other hand, we have intros, we have outros, we have announcements and that. So it's quite obvious that if you search for something and the only mentions in the top results are in the ads, then the user will be, well, not very, very satisfied at all. <laughs> uh, 
And the final challenge I wanted to talk about in order search is, well, it's not really completely unique to audio, but, but it's an important step in, uh, in uh, determining uh, links between uh, content. So unlike uh, web pages, which have hyperlinks, audio, audio files don't have such a thing. So it's, um, somehow we would like to see what content is related to what. And, and we do it by basically determining what uh, episodes talk about the same things. To do that, we have to actually understand what, what do the key phrases and keywords mean. For example, in this given context, you can see that the meaning is quite context dependent. So does the word Puma refer to the clothing brand or does it refer to the uh, animal? And uh, in only like one case, which is the animal, should we link this episode with content that talks about cougars and, and panthers as well? So now I have talked about our challenges, and the next thing I want to talk about is solutions. Well, the big secret is we don't have a single solution, at least not technical one. Um, currently, our pipeline consists of, uh, of many, many different components with very different level of maturity. So the maturity of each component usually depends on the amount of available annotated data. Uh, for some problems uh, that are more universal, like punctuation and capitalization, you may have freely available data and a lot of it. So we can immediately start with advanced methods, but more unique problems uh, require manual annotation. And this can be quite time consuming and expensive. So for most of our components, we usually start with uh, building an evaluation set. And a yeah, rather simple and sometimes quite hacky uh, and even rule-based solutions. So, but uh, even though it might not work very well, it still establishes a baseline to actually see if more advanced things work. And once we have annotated enough data, we, at some point we set some of it aside for training data and start experimenting with simple supervised models. Uh, like linear regression or things like that. And of course the final goal is to have enough, enough data to experiment with anything like that re requires a lot of data, like deep learning. And some components already in our pipeline use deep learning. Uh, what remains universal across all components is that uh, evaluation is really important. Uh, Otherwise, you will have no idea if, uh, if your additional efforts actually pay off. Uh, but it turns out that um, component level evaluation itself is quite a bit of a challenge if you have a pipeline. Because, um, well, almost always the preceding components in a pipeline might change. So in input to your current uh, component might change, so you have to basically rebuild your evaluation set. Uh, in that sense, we have uh, discovered that uh, it's much simpler to just evaluate end-to-end -end because, well, end-to-end, -end, I mean, like starting from ASR and finishing with search index. And yeah, uh, because the input doesn't change and, uh, and, and maybe even more importantly, I think it's uh, even more useful because uh, the stuff that you measure is more likely to correlate with uh, what users actually find useful. Um, so here also, here we also start with uh, an initial pipeline that may consist of simple things, and we build an initial evaluation set. So this is um, before we have any users, so it's just our best guess how users might interact with our system. For search, basically, we just come up with random queries on our 
a set of documents that we have collected, and humans rate results depending on relevancy. Um, then we, of course, measure performance and deploy, and then, then things get interesting when you actually have deployed the first version and get, get real users. I think the important part here is that once you have deployed and you have users, you probably must uh, collect uh, data about how they interact with your system. Um, because it might turn out that your initial evaluation set was uh, completely off, uh, and actually users use your system completely differently. So basically, again, uh, taking search, for example, the queries that you came up might be uh, overly complex, and the users maybe use uh, much simpler queries, like one or two words. And this, uh, basically this cycle of um, updating your evaluation set, improving your pipeline, measuring performance and deploying again, this lasts the entire lifetime of your product because, well, the user behavior uh, probably changes because it is affected by trends, uh, especially in search. And sometimes it can be even affected by, by simple things like uh, user interface changes. Um, maybe one important thing that uh, you should also consider when building the, or improving the evaluation set is uh, that you uh, focus on, on uh, the use cases where the impact is largest. Uh, again, in search, this would be the most frequent queries that affect the largest number of, uh, of your users. And, well, while the challenges I talked about were quite technical, as you can see, uh, the universally useful thing that we found across our, our systems is basically just a process, although you can, of course, automate it, and, and, and uh, then only the annotation part is manual. And this is basically all I wanted to talk about, so let me quickly summarize to things wrap things up. Um, as you saw, uh, Audio Search has some unique and quite interesting challenges. For example, it lacks structure, so we have to recover it. And even if you recover the structure, you discover that its parts are not equally important for search. And you have, have to also um, recover relationships between different content. Uh, while solving these challenges, we have learned that um, there is no universal technical solution, but rather a process that works. Um, and we also learned that it doesn't make sense to optimize costs too early, uh, because you will lose a lot of time. So buy things that you can and focus on things that no one else has done before. Um, for things that you do have to implement yourself, um, we would recommend to uh, start with very simple things, just to establish a baseline, and gradually improve while, of course, measuring progress. And, and of course, uh, the most, most useful thing so far has been end-to-end uh, -end evaluation, and, and the important point here is that uh, try to stay up to date with user behavior. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Amazing takeaways here. We have time still for questions. So I'm here with the mic. Can you pass it on? Um, with something that needs so much development, because the base of your business is actually this development. Uh, how could you validate in the very early phase of your project? How could you validate the the project itself? Uh, what tool do you use, or how could you go for it with something that needed so much development in a technical way? Well, uh, the first proof of concept uh, didn't actually take so much time. As I said, like we started with very basic and simple things. So, uh, what is your target audience? 
it's like uh, because uh, for the content to be discoverable, uh, the content needs to be in the platform. So you are focusing on like a big companies to consume your service, or you are focusing on uh, users to consume the content. Yeah, good question. Uh, well, at the moment we are uh, mostly business to business uh, focused. So basically, our clients are are content providers. One last question. To which extent can your service be applied for monitoring? Um, in marketing uh, context, for example, or with uh, if a customer is interested in specific uh, subjects, topics, or keywords to monitor media or whatever? Is it already applicable, or are you still on the way towards something like this? Well, I think it uh, it would be quite useful for that also, <laughs> although this is not our target use case. But I mean, like, if you want to see how how well how how uh, podcast guests and hosts talk about your company, then it's easily easy to find using our search engine. Thank you so much, Otokar. And I have two mics. These were our four talks. The guys are around. We also have uh, Velio, Kalev, Marco from Super Angels. If you have any questions about uh, getting an investment or uh, me some mentoring for your startup, either business-wise or uh, machine learning related. I thank you all for coming. Stay tuned. We're going to announce uh, new events. And uh, next time, they're going to go even more deeper uh, about machine learning. Enjoy the night and uh, uh, thank you for coming. Bye for our, for our audience online. <laughs>